Good morning, everyone. My name is Joan Batorf. I'm a professor in the School of Nursing and director of the Institute for Healthy Living and Chronic Disease Prevention here at UBC Okanagan in Kelowna. Before we begin, uh, I do want to welcome everyone to this webinar. And I also want to take a moment to respectfully acknowledge that UBC Okanagan is situated on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Silk Okanagan Nation and their people. And I also want to acknowledge that you may be joining us from many places, both near and far. And I want to acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of those lands as well. Just a few housekeeping things before we begin. You may see a closed captioning box on your screen. And of course, you can move it to your preferred location by clicking and dragging it, or you can turn it off the closed captioning using the live transcript button in the menu bar. There will be opportunity for discussion and questions towards the end. So I encourage you at any time to type any comments and questions in the chat box and um, we will address those um, at, towards the end of the session today. So today's event is a research to practice webinar co-hosted by the Institute for Healthy Living and Chronic Disease Prevention and our partners, North Okanagan Hospice Society. Um, before we begin, I want to acknowledge today is uh, November 15th and it's National Grief and Bereavement Day. And no better time than to have a presentation like this to recognize that grief holds a place in all of our lives. And then particularly in this context that we're going to hear about today. So I want to turn it over to Clara Dick, who's the education and resource leader at the North Okanagan Hospice Society to introduce our speaker for this morning. Clara. Hi, thanks, Joan. You know, North Okanagan Hospice Society is so pleased to have a 10-year collaboration uh, relationship with Institute for Healthy Living and Chronic Disease Prevention. Uh, so just celebrating that today. And um, I, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce Dr. Roseanne Bethune. She's an adjunct prof professor at the School of Nursing at uh, University of Victoria. So she will be sharing her research today on exploring grief following MAID, bereavement experiences of friends and family. So Roseanne, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Okay, excellent, Clara, um, thank you. Thank you, Clara, thank you, Joan. And just um, an honor and a joy to be here today. And I wanted to just um, say that I'm coming to you from the Saanich Peninsula, Vancouver Island, um, the land of the Lekongwen people. Um, so just welcome to everybody. Um, as I said, an honor and a joy to be here today. And the topic seems very appropriate that it is uh, National Grief and Bereavement Day, of course, across Canada. Uh, my presentation will draw on research uh, done by myself and my colleagues. My colleagues are listed here. So Anne, Marty, Betty, and Sarah, um, they are with us in spirit, but could not be in person. So just to acknowledge that Marnie's with Victoria Hospice, many of you may know her, and um, Anne is a professor at the University of Victoria. Next slide. So just in terms of disclosures, um, nothing to disclose, no financial relationships. And next slide. So just before we dive in, I want to acknowledge that some of you may have experienced and participated in assisted death in some way, and this could be um, personally or professionally, and that some of you still may be grieving. I hope this um, session provides insights, maybe some answers, information that might be helpful, but, but I, um, I hold you in my heart. So the next slide, this one that we're talking about, sorry, uh, just the overview. I'm sharing with Jacinta and... Uh, we're just kind of uh, perfecting the art here. So um, if you can just hold there for a second, um, go back one, Jacinta. Thanks, no, backwards. Uh, um, if you can just go I'm back. I'm sorry, to... I'm having troubles with this at the moment and oh. I'm not sure why I'm going forwards and not backwards. Okay.
if you can go backwards, fine. And if not, just pause here. And I'll so, pause. Um, Sorry. yeah, pause is good. No worries. So the next slide that, that you'll see when you get this sent to you, um, it just talks about an overview of what I'm going to talk about today. And of course, we'll talk about uh, a little bit about the Canadian context um, here in Canada, current state. I'll describe the study. I'll share findings. Um, I'll explore practice implications, and um, we'll share different resources and references. And then I, um, so just to talk a little bit about the content, of course, MADE is still a relatively new option in Canada, 2016. Um, in some ways, it feels like yesterday, but it's been six years. And so it, Bill C-14 came to us, as you know, um, 2016. And what's unique about medical assistance in dying is that it, it, it offers persons the option of an intravenous um, assisted death or an oral option. And this is very different than say something like uh, the different states across the United States of America where they only have the option of the oral. So Canada is unique in that way. And I wanted to just also say that the federal government in Canada releases an annual federal report of statistics across the country. The last report, which was all 2021 data, uh, just came out this past summer. And at that point, they said um, in the year 2021, over 10,000 Canadians um, ha had suffering, met the criteria and opted for this choice. And in Canada to date, by the end of 2021, more than 31,664 persons had um, had an assisted death. So that just gives you some context. And then I wanted to just, uh, we had Bill C-14, um, but in just last year in March, Bill C-7, so those were amendments and some people might say corrections or improvements to the law. So that was Bill C-7 that happened in March. And we now talk about um, two pathways or two tracks of assisted dying, one for persons with a reasonably foreseeable natural death, and then the other for persons with a non-reasonably foreseeable natural death. Um, a non-reasonably foreseeable natural death might be um, someone living uh, and suffering with fibromyalgia, maybe uh, pain syndrome, that kind of thing. Um, and also last March, they introduced what is now called a waiver of final consent so that uh, the 10-day waiting period is gone, but also a, a final consent can be given in advance. And that was um, partly due to um, Audrey's amendment coming out of the East Coast, a young woman who died of breast cancer. Um, so you will know with Bill C-7-2 something very significant about to happen in March of 2023, pardon me, 2023. Um, I think in my slides, sorry, I said March of 2022. It is coming in the next few months, so March. And it, it, the change will be that persons will now be eligible with a sole underlying diagnosis of a mental illness. Um, safeguards and protocols are being developed as we speak, but that is coming. And I only share this because all of this information, all of these changes, alterations um, will continue to inform our understanding of grief and bereavement with assisted dying. So, um, and one last thing, and this is on just a quick previous slide um, that I called current state. And I just wanted to say that I talked to my colleagues at Health Canada. Thank you, Jackie and Jamie. Um, and Health Canada has provided um, funding for research regarding assisted dying and what they're doing currently is shifting to a very broad um, focus with large projects. They are committed to 2.6 million dollars annually and their priorities um, related to assisted dying and research. The priorities are models of delivery across the country, oversight models, mature minors, palliative care, advanced care planning and made, and others. Um, there is no process to apply for the funds at this point, um, but that is still um, evolving as we speak. So for today, the research question that I wanted to address is, what is the bereavement experience of family members following an assisted death? And the aim of my colleagues and I was to describe the bereavement experience of loved ones, to explore how supporting or not supporting them, uh, the how whether they supported or not supported their loved ones, if that made a difference to their bereavement. And then lastly, to identify information and supports. So this is the slide where we want to be on. So this is excellent. Thank you. Um, and so the methodology for this study is uh, based on the research uh, model of Sally Thorne out of UBC. And 
interpreted dis description is obviously an, a qualitative uh, narrative based approach and it aims to look at clinical context and, and generate knowledge that is useful and can be applied in the clinical setting. So really appropriate for today's audience. And I just wanted to add also that with qualitative research, um, many of you may be familiar, but the beauty is that it's looking at the human experience and, and seeking to understand. And when we do glimpse and glean understanding of another's lived experience, it serves to ignite our compassion, it serves to spark conversation, and it shines a light on our shared humanity. So very, very important. And that's what we're doing here today. Um, next slide. This talks a little bit about the participants and data collection. And we had nine participants in the study. It so happens that they were all women. That's who comes forth. And that maybe lets us know about society. I believe most caregivers in society are women. Um, and the average time of the bereaved was 15 months. One woman was bereaved for four months. Another up to was three years. One in-depth interview occurred, and that was one of our researchers, um, a very, very experienced clinical um, end-of-life counselor. So intimate interviews, uh, all in person except for the two by telephone um, during COVID. And our recruitment poster was, as you, our recruitment was via snowballing, et cetera, as you would imagine. And if anyone wanted to see any examples of the questions we asked, um, in the accompanying article that speaks to this research, some of those questions are listed. Um, the next slide talks about data analysis. And so what we did, obviously we read the transcripts, transcripts we reflective memos back and forth, um, ideas that come to us, we kept track of that, we shared at our team meetings. And we also used additional analytic narrative devices. We used um, synthesized short stories. So we would all go over an interview together, listen to it, read it, and then use the exact words of the participant and put together um, a short story. Uh, we used key storylines, we used found poetry. So the whole idea of these different techniques and devices is to immerse ourselves in the data. And we kept asking ourselves, what is coming to the fore? And we found that so much of what was happening in the stories, it seemed very common to the grief process. So we were just looking for those nuances. What is different in this context of assisted dying? On the next slide, I'll just let you read it to yourselves, but it's an example of found poetry that um, our team created out of the study. On the next slide, yeah, here it is. This is what I wanted to share and um, I can just read it with you. We kept her body for two days, wanting time to digest. People came, all her friends, spent the day painting the prayer of St. Francis on her cardboard casket listening to music she loved, doing nothing, just sitting with her because we'd imagined it together. Then I put a blanket over her, face exposed. She looked radiant, passing by our honor guard, standing and witnessing. It was a remarkable two days, so digestive. So this is an example, all using one participant's words, and she had put together a ritual for a friend, and that involved people coming to the house for two days, playing guitars, having food, um, listening to music exactly as her friend had hoped, wished, imagined, and discussed with her. And the participant who shared this story of the whole funeral following her friend's death, it really emphasizes the importance of just slowing everything down. And that was the exact words that she used, is it allowed her time to digest the experience. The next slide, this is when I've got a question for you. Do you think bereavement following made is different than bereavement after a quote, natural death? And this is a polling question. Um, so if you can just submit your answer, we'll see everyone's responses.
let me know when we get the answers. So, so the majority of people are saying a little different, some not different, some very different. So we've got mixed, um, mixed answers, which, which makes sense. Um, what I wanted to say is that our, in our study, our findings suggest that uh, bereavement following mate is not different, although the type of death is different for sure. Most definitely, um, the bereavement itself is not so different. So let's talk about that. I'll go to the next slide. And this one's called High Points. As I mentioned, we created a short story, story for each participant and graphed it out. We looked at high points that, of things that they talked about for themselves. We talked about when they hit low points and we talked about um, critical turning points for them. So on this slide, it's just a summary of all different participants and what they identified as high points. So we found patterns. Our participants um, overwhelmingly said they felt phenomenal support of healthcare professionals involved. Um, quotations, they said, you know, he did it his way. She had the death she wanted, so peaceful and so right. Um, many expressed, um, I was so proud of him and me too for staying strong enough to have happy days beforehand. I was honored to have been part of her death. And high points, our participants also talked about rituals and ceremonies. They talked about um, the ability to say goodbye, to prepare as a family, gratitude for the time beforehand and the memories they could share and reflect on. In the next slide, we highlight some of our findings, which are turning points. Pardon me, low points are next. Whoops, sorry about that. We're just a little bit ahead. So I'm going to just, um, you'll have this when you get your package, but in terms of low points, I'll just read them to you. The low points, um, participants said they were worried about capacity to consent. They were worried about losing final consent capacity. Participants were concerned. I couldn't show my feelings of being sad. Yeah, thanks. Um, I'm just still at the low points. Um, so just one back still. Yeah, you got it. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So yeah, I um, couldn't show one daughter was that I, I couldn't show my feelings of being sad or show um, I was scared in the days leading up. And no opportunity to sit, vis sit vigil. I felt cheated. It felt like death happened too quickly. It's sudden. They don't, they don't fade away. It's shocking. Uh, a low point for another participant. She said it was the first experience of ever seeing someone die. She said, very hard to watch. I felt completely shell-shocked. Um, others talked about feeling numb with grief. Um, one of our participants said, I supported it, yet my inner turmoil lingle, lingers. So you can, in the low points, you can sense some tensions and sense-making for our participants. And in the next slide, um, this refers to turning points. And the turning points are our participants. These are places in their story when they were talking where you could see a shift happening or, or things changed for them. Um, for one participant, um, she said, to even learn that it was an option, I, I, was, I was just shocked. Uh, another person um, said the embodied impact of knowing the exact time, and I'll read some stories about that. Um, but that was the turning point, just that it just hit her literally in her body. Um, others talked about the countdown, just starting to count down just uh, was very visceral. Uh, moving to acceptance, it felt selfish of mom at first, but then I realized I could get what I needed. And um, lastly, being able to witness the energy transformation and realize he was not there anymore. That was what um, one participants said. And for many people, um, also a huge turning point was the ask when the, the, the loved one, friend or family member um, turned to them and said, um, this is what I want to pursue. Will you help me? Um, so we have a second question from our audience. 
for our audience. And it is, do you think having a known date and time of death brings grief forward for loved ones? So the majority, our poll is showing that the majority of persons, 62% of you believe yes, 25% uh, are thinking maybe, and a smaller percentage are thinking um, that it doesn't bring grief forward. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so our next slide um, dives right into the findings of our study, and we found that the experience of bereavement um, the, the countdown, all the various aspects of having a made death does indeed bring grief forward. So we talk about the countdown, um, this idea that my assisted death will happen on November the 20th. Okay, I've got, that's five days, five, four, three. And that our participants said that the countdown ignited grief early. The time before death was very, very impactful for them. And in our study, we ended up using the term grief bereavement because the stories Usually if you're talking to someone about their bereavement experience, they would, it might be, well, my loved one died and, and now this is my bereavement, but they couldn't separate the stories. It was all rolled up in one and that whole idea that the grief is triggered and starts so early. So in addition to that main finding that the countdown brings grief forward, we also found three sub-themes and the sub-themes um, are as follows. And I'll start with each one individually and I'll just give you examples. So the first sub-theme is the certainty of date and time. And the certainty of date and time um, acts to intensify a parade of lasts. So this is the last time we went for a car ride. This is the last time we had a meal together. This is the last time, etc. So that definitely intensified. Um, knowing the date and time initiated a countdown to death and knowing a date and time it actually afforded time to plan and say goodbye. So that was a very positive thing. Um, the next, uh, pardon me, I'm just going to read this story, which is um, around uh, a woman sharing her experience. Um, sorry, I'm still back on the previous slide. Sorry about that, thanks. The hardest, so this is a, one of our participants, she's talking about the breath of her, the death of her brother, and this is what she states regarding the time of certainty. The hardest moment came for me when Dan asked me to make the call. He had been having more pain, and he looked up at me from the floor where he was playing with his granddaughter and asked me to call to schedule the assisted death. I had to step onto the patio to have a quick cry, and his daughter did too but I knew we had to be strong. So I pulled myself together and went back to make the call. The countdown to made was difficult for us as a family. The whole thing just felt like a series of lasts. We all gathered the night before his death at our younger brother's place, and he pointed out the new moon. I told him, I'll think of him whenever I see that moon. That was probably the hardest night of my life with the awkwardness of knowing he would die the next morning. So that's just um, an example of that theme, um, very powerful uh, words and feelings. And the second sub-theme that's listed on this slide um, is about the active engagement of family members and loved ones. They're, they're pulled into the process and often have to take on roles of planning, pulling it all together, um, getting forms ready, etc. And with that, um, it helps support um, sense making for individuals and for some of them to take on that role of planner and almost event planner and coordinator um, had a positive impact and for some it was not so um, easily carried out and I'll just read you an example of that. 
So as I said, um, from the time of diagnosis, um, they're actively involved, they're informing, gathering, planning, arrangements, whether it's equipment, etc. And so one of the daughters, um, th these are her exact words, she said, it made it so much easier. When the decision comes, things have to happen to move quickly. And if you're aware of the things you can do before someone dies to make it easier after, there's a lot to be done at that time. It's very shocking and alarming to just go from one thing to the next from the time the decision without time to absorb. And here's another participant. She was a wife and um, this is what she said. Um, this was his decision, but it wasn't mine. I was the one that had to deal everything. It was very, very difficult. And I just wanted to then talk a little bit about um, Sorry, and here's another example of that, uh, a participant just sharing their burden with having to be pulled into that active engagement role. If you're the family, you're the one who has to deal with everything to make it all happen. You have to get the papers signed. You have to deal with the body and then the funeral arrangements and everything else. It's very shocking and alarming just to go from one thing to the next without time to absorb. Have a team helping you with that. I think I needed some spiritual guidance. I needed some more support myself. Somebody who has the capacity and the depth to kind of sit with you and support you through the complexity of not only a death, but a death through assisted death and all of that. And the other thing is, is like, where was my person to debrief this big situation? He was gone. My spiritual guide died. I'm still recovering from it all. I'm not sure if people have had this, these experiences or can relate to them or not. Um, and so the third theme on this slide, still the bottom point, is that this whole notion we heard from our participants was about enacting made as ceremony and the power of rituals. Um, and we're talking about rituals before, after, and during, and not necessarily rituals in big capital R, uh, fancy, elaborate, um, and yet some were, um, but often it was just the sim simple things. So using the idea of ritual or, or ceremony interchangeably. And the power of these acts basically serves to slow everything down, gives people, as we heard, time to digest the grief and loss. Very, very personal, unique. Um, some ritual ceremonies filled with um, humor, some very spiritual, some religious, um, some loud, quiet, small, big. But what they do is they help to infuse meaning and even to bring words to an experience that in that moment can be quite unsayable. So that just offers you some um, insight into what participants shared. I'll read a story more specifically about ceremony. Um, and this is the story of one daughter who explained um, how it helped with her grieving. I think it's one of the most important pieces of dealing with death, and especially with maid, in, to include ritual, because it anchors you in the present. It's so hard. It's just a blur. Your hormones are going. Your mind is racing. Your heart is torn in pieces. But to be able to have a ritual that just grounds you and reminds, me, reminds you of where you are right now, and that the person who is dying is actively still living. They're actually living. It's hard, you know, when you look back after traumatic events or difficult events. It's hard to remember. Things are so hazy. But when you use ritual, it makes a few moments clear. And you can really keep that in your heart. And it helps. Ritual is about marking what's happening now and about letting go. I think it's one of the most important things for the process. And then for softening grief afterwards. She said that so, so beautifully. And just a last little smile about the, a small ritual that um, a, a daughter had with her mother. She said, it's so personal. So I mean, we had an afternoon. She's talking about a, her mom. She said, so we had an afternoon where mom said, I want lemon pie, lemon meringue pie and Colin Firth. And so we, my sister and I, we went and rented Pride and Prejudice we brought in lemon meringue pie, and that was our ritual that summed up our relationship. 
This is what we did as a family. So to do these important things one last time. Um, okay, next slide, please. So just moving more um, into the conclusion, the um, wanted to just talk a little bit, uh, our finding that bereavement, it, it is and it isn't different. Um, you know, the counselors on our research team said that a lot of what people are experiencing, if they haven't experienced death before, um, a lot of the patterns of grief and bereavement experienced are common, but definitely there are uniquenesses. Um, the date, knowing it ahead, amplifies everything. And when participants shared their experience, their stories, they, they, they rolled it all into one complete whole experience. They, they weren't able to divide out or separate it into separate stories. And just to emphasize that this is an emergent area of knowledge development, we're still learning, of course, and that everything we're learning, we want to um, impart into practice so that we can better support early grief and the bereft. Um, really important just to um, help with sense making and grief. So in terms of practice implications, I want to um, just go to the next slide. And what healthcare professionals need to know in order to prepare, support and inform families. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the medical, technical, physiological, then I'm going to talk about the the need to expect the unexpected and challenging situations. So just stay on this slide here and I'll just um, share these. So because families need to know information in order to help them make sense, then it makes sense that um, healthcare professionals need to know and understand such that they can prepare, support and inform. And I don't know how many of you have had the, um, the privilege and the honor to be present at an assisted death. Um, if, if you have, that, I, I hope the experience was positive. And um, if you have an opportunity or, or are invited, I, I would suggest that you do, you do attend just to, um, to learn, to inform, to grow and understand. And so from a medical technical aspect, um, healthcare professionals, I believe they need to know that um, with an assisted death, death is different. And I've had so many nurses say to me uh, through my clinical years of supporting assisted dying, nurses have said, oh, I know death. Um, but believe me, in assisted death, it is different in many ways. For example, the death happens very fast. Um, from the time the first, um, the first medication is administered, death happens within maybe eight to 10 minutes. So it's very, very fast. Uh, the coloring of a person changes quickly. There's almost a, a graying effect that happens and it's very visible and this can um, surprise um, or shock people. So these are things if they understand, they can anticipate. Um, and in British Columbia, our province has a, a standard protocol for medications that are used. Other provinces um, may have some variability. And of the four drugs in British Columbia, each is followed by a saline push. And again, if families can understand that in the moment, they're focusing on their loved one. They're not thinking, why are there so many syringes? What's happening? And even though four medications, saline pushes, um, with the propofol, there, there are often more than one syringe because the volume is large. And um, the drugs used are used in everyday clinical practice across our hospitals. They're just used obviously in different dosages and um, midazolam to um, induce sedation, uh, lidocaine for a numbing effect, propofol and uh, rocuronium to ensure the heart is stopped. Um, in Canada, people can choose to have an oral cocktail as well. Um, if they do, your physician or MP would bring that, but even if they have an oral choice, um, an IV is started and every physician MP who's providing the assisted death always brings two drug kits with them. And the, um, the second drug kit would be an IV kit if needed. And the, the second drug kit is there for safety if they need to draw in more medication or anything like that. And I, 
I think for clinical clinicians, it can be a shock to care for the, the body afterwards, even though healthcare professionals may be uh, familiar and certainly nurses do that. It's, it's different. I know one nurse said to me, she was caring for the body and yet the body was still warm. So it's different than a natural death maybe where a body has slowly um, shut down and functioning and the body is cooler. So to be aware is to be informed. Um, and in terms of healthcare professionals, another aspect of expect the unexpected. And I just wanted to say in that regard, um, we talked about um, ceremonies, rituals, but people are almost having a living wake for themselves. They're almost planning and um, staging different events. People will have pictures, slideshows, um, uh, maybe a, a glass of whiskey or champagne, um, sometimes very loud music, families, really, really good food, children, dogs, and almost a party atmosphere just prior. Um, sometimes very, very quiet. And I think we all maybe die as we have lived. Um, our uniqueness has come to the fore. Um, some persons have had uh, the media present. They've wanted to be an advocate right to the end. Um, others have worn special outfits, um, maybe a beautiful red silk dress. Um, some have worn even a costume, a costume with humor, uh, a t-shirt with a funny uh, saying on it. Um, others have had music, Stairway to Heaven, uh, a hymn, something like that. Others have had poems read. They've had um, people, uh, a priest come and deliver last rites. We've had, um, you know, rabbis, different religious uh, leaders present for blessings. We've had um, death doulas present to, to lead um, family, to support family, etc. So, so very, very unique. And I would say if you have the opportunity to attend, um, to expect the unexpected and um, no judgment. It's just um, how people say goodbye in their own unique way. And just a couple of um, additional practice strategies if you're a healthcare professional. It's okay if you're involved um, in whatever supportive role to ask the maid provider um, for a huddle before and a debrief after, and that can include the family, the debrief after. Um, if you're present in the room at an assisted death, um, it is certainly um, okay to keep an eye on family members, how everybody's doing. And if you see someone being very uncomfortable, um, et cetera, you, you can, gently ask if they would like to leave and then bring them in immediately after. Um, also a really big thing is if you're present, family members are in the room. We don't want this to be a medical procedure. This is a, a, the, the death of a loved one. Um, invite, give family loved ones permission to get on the bed, sit on the bed, lean in, touch, kiss, hold a hand, stroke their head. Like um, that is absolutely okay. And, um, and then after the death uh, for family, loved ones to linger, absolutely uh, very important. And all these things help to embody um, and to slow down the experience that they're having. And just always we really a suggestion to be thoughtful about the words you use. Um, I often try and, when I'm talking to family members, I wouldn't say, oh, your loved one died of maid. I would say your loved one died of cancer, ALS. That's the underlying root of their suffering and what ultimately um, ended their life. And the maid was just a, the mechanism. Um, it, I think of if you had a family member, a friend who had ended their life by suicide. Um, now we don't, we try and destigmatize language. We wouldn't say that somebody committed suicide, which almost goes back to those days of uh, stigmatized language, committing a crime, adultery, etc. We would say um, someone died of depression, someone um, suicided, um, someone died by suicide. So just, just the nuances of language, and I'm sure many of you have examples of that as well. And um, I've also got two resources. I want to suggest that it is um, okay to bring up the topic of assisted dying with a patient um, in your practice. And two resources um, speak to that. The Canadian Association of Maid Assessors and Providers has a clinical guideline um, that talks about um, that uh, with, the, with the, um, the support. And if people 
people can access that directly through CAMAP or um, email admin at camapcanada.ca to request a copy. And also, for example, in British Columbia, uh, the college, um, the BC College of Nurses and Midwives um, has a guiding page where they say, um, yes, the criminal code permits healthcare professionals to provide information to a client about the lawful provision of made. Nurses can provide information, engage in, dis engage in discussions and educate their clients about MAID. And, but this just isn't across the board, absolutely any professional. So for example, uh, a nurse would have to um, only share the information based on the assessment and the appropriate context. So just caution there. Um, and that's just, um, we've had different participants say that they were shocked that no one told them about MAID. And when they did let them know that their loved one could have chosen that, it was too late or they had lost um, capacity to consent. Um, and so again, all those things impact grief. And if so, we can know ahead, that's better. Um, and you might ask me like of all the different things we've talked about here, um, would it be good to have a tip sheet that we could give to healthcare providers to go over with families? And actually our research team, we thought about that, we talked about it, we developed one, we played with it, grappled. Um, and in the end, we, we just felt troubled a little bit by it. We felt cautious. Um, we, we thought it might over medicalize um, and reduce the experience. So, you know, I, I think that remains to evolve with time and other researchers and um, the work. And just to know like group uh, bereavement with assisted dying, um, challenging situations. If one family member um, isn't on board or doesn't agree, that can definitely impact grief afterwards. Um, sometimes the person who's choosing the assisted death has not told their family. Um, and so that can definitely be um, a shock and impact. Sometimes patients are transferred out of a care setting and the staff have so diligently cared for them uh, for days, months, maybe even years, um, don't or weren't informed and that can be um, certainly upsetting. So those are, I'm just sharing some experiences. Um, I'm going to go to the next slide now. And I just wanted to talk about, I think I've got two minutes left. I wanted to talk some knowledge translation resources. There is a little booklet that you can download, um, part of our research, a previous study. You can use that booklet, you can adapt it um, to your own healthcare setting, etc. cetera, um, make it a little more specific, but you have permission to do that if it's helpful. And um, there was recently a webinar with Dr. Kanye Troughton and others uh, from UBC, Compassionate Conversations and End of Life Discussing Made, and there's the contact information. Um, next slide. Other resources, uh, if you're working with families, friends, um, that are grieving. Um, certainly local hospice societies. There is uh, Bridge C14, which is um, a peer-to-peer -peer connective group, and also Dying with Dignity has different resources and webinars recorded. Next. And this is actually quite phenomenal. It's uh, fairly newly posted, but the Canadian Virtual Hospice and uh, MyGrief My Grief.ca, uh, they have a module online and it's called Grief and Made and well developed by um, uh, Marty Thompson, one of our researchers and um, other uh, individuals from across Canada. So this just gives you an overview of the content that's in there. Uh, next slide. And they have a resource page in that module and they, uh, they list like kidsgrief.ca, talking to children, additional resources, guides, peer support on the bottom one there, Bridge for You is fairly new. Um, next slide. And I just wanted to highlight these um, three articles just uh, published now in 2022, all related to grief. The first one by La Perel, um, similar to findings to our study, um, uses, they talk about a metaphor of hero. Our participants talked about, um, they were so proud of their loved one, the courage it took, etc. They talk about um, a hero metaphor. Uh, uh, and so finding similar in all of these, um, in the last one by Jan and team, um, supported by Maid House out of Toronto, um, they, can, they also do presentations. They uh, used a metaphor for their findings around a dandelion. It's a beautiful um, presentation. Next slide. 
and these are just res references from today and next and that's um the end of the presentation thank you thank you very very much uh roseanne that was really really interesting and it's it is really interesting to see so much attention now being paid to uh to made and really developing at least a beginning knowledge base in this area, both for healthcare providers and also for family members and caregivers. Um, so this is very encouraging. And clearly a lot of this work is hot off the press. So uh, congratulations on your study and, um, and obviously a very important contribution to the field. So I would invite people to add any comments or questions to the chat box now. Uh, Roseanne, just to let you know that there are some people in the audience who have um, assisted or been with care with family members who have participated in MAID. Um, and there are many thank yous. Uh, there's also some thank yous coming in. Um, but um, I'm wondering, you gave lots of suggestions for healthcare providers. I'm wondering in terms of family members, caregivers, um, are there some, some helpful guidelines, um, maybe at the beginning when these decisions are being made by their family member? Are there ways that they might support those decisions or facilitate them in some way? Open up the discussion? I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Joan. Good question. This is one of the um, resources that I had talked to. It's a guide, and I said anyone could take that or adapt it. And um, so that's something we've published. It's um, on the public website. Anyone can find it. But like I said, you could adapt it. And it's it's written, it's actually a support guide to support patients. It's for patients. Oh, right. So our clinicians give that to patients, but it says patients and families. So for the patient, it says, okay, this is a time you need to reflect. What's important to you? What would give you meaning? What do you want to happen here? Um, so it, it poses questions like that and was developed by uh, like um, clinicians with uh, grief and bereavement knowledge as well. And so we've had positive feedback on that and we've shared it uh, with colleagues across Canada, Australia. So that mm -hmm. might be something. Mm -hmm. That's great, thank you. Um... There is, there's question about the website and resources, but the PowerPoint and recording, just so that everyone knows, will be shared with people who have registered for this. So they will have access, everyone will have access to those websites that you listed and also the list of those publications. Um, so that's great. We have a comment from Lizzie. This is a really important presentation and research. Thank you. And then another one from Cindy saying, excellent. Did I, I'm curious from our audience, um, anything surprise any of our audience members, anything surprise or like an aha moment that you had? Yeah, so I invite people to add any comments like that. Um, we have one comment from Catherine, who says, as a hospice volunteer, we've been told not to talk about MAID. I don't know if you want to comment about that. Maybe both Roseanne and Clara. Yeah. Roseanne, uh, what, uh, do you, uh, what do you, uh, you work in hospice, right? Um, no, I, I for um, six years, I was the clinical nurse specialist for the assisted dying program on the island. But I gave the example of CAMAP with their guideline on, on who can bring up the topic of May. And then I gave the example of the College of uh, Registered Nurses and Midwives out of BC. So um, if you were an OT, a PT, a, a registered counselor, you would go to your college and look for direction. If you're a volunteer working for um, a hospice, then I would go to that hospice society and see what direction they have. Um, and that's really important because you want um, people to be um, comfortable, but also informed, uh, not start conversations that aren't appropriate, etc. Um, so yeah, unique to settings, but um, clinically check with your um, professional organization. Yeah, that's good and advice. I, Do you want to add something, Clara? Yeah, um, that's, that's great. And, you know, if you have a registered professional body, you go to them, like you say, Roseanne. In terms of volunteers, it's really about um, 
we have a team approach, at least in our hospice. So if the client brings it up and it's because often we'll find here in our experiences, clients, it's not just a, I've made a decision, it's a decision. And then there's, there's a lot of ver outside verbal reflection. And that reflection happens with volunteers, with our care aides and our nurses. So um, we do have, you know, policy in place for volunteers and, and talking about medical assistance and dying. And that's what I would um, suggest um, that hospice volunteer talk to their, their leader about where they can go. Yeah. yeah. We've got a question from Marilyn. In your research, did you speak with any family members who did not personally support MAID, perhaps for religious reasons, et cetera, but were trying to support their loved one's decision? If so, how would the experience of accompanying their loved one affect their grieving process? Yeah, yeah. no, that's that's a great question. We didn't have anyone um, who didn't object in our study for religious reasons, although that definitely, um, we, we see that in the media and in different situations. I'll read you one young, um, one young daughter, it's, it's very short, but this is, um, she has lingering questions for sure. And she supported her dad because she loved him. And uh, this is what she says. Let me put it in her words because she spoke so eloquently. She said, we always knew my dad would want a medically assisted death because he had watched his own mom suffer and didn't ever want that to happen to himself or for his family's sake. He said, I don't want to be a burden to my family. We were happy for him that it had become legal two years prior to him meeting it. But I thought, well, goodness sakes, why don't you ask your family if they want you to be a burden? Because I'm fine with it. The thing I liked least about MAID that I found actually almost the hardest was knowing that my dad was going to die on a set date and I had this finite number of days and I felt like I couldn't act like he was actually dying. I felt I wasn't allowed to be sad or show that I was sad. I didn't realize how weird it would feel to know four more days, three more days. He was able to come home from hospital the day before and then he died the next evening. He wanted a small gathering of family and close friends. We formed this big U shape around his bed and basically had a, a half hour service around his bedside with prayers and singing. You felt an enormous amount of love in that room. That was very special to be part of. Then my mom and I stayed while everyone else went downstairs while the procedure commenced. I was holding my dad's hand because that's what he wanted and it was right. I wished I had known what to look for or sense in some way. I missed watching my dad's spirit leave his body. I've never watched someone die before. I didn't realize what it would look like. It was really a lot harder than I imagined. I felt completely shell-shocked. I was glad I was there because I wanted to know what happened, but it was really hard to watch and not a good experience for me. I felt like the worst possible thing to happen, even though I knew it was exactly what my dad wanted. And I know he was happy with his decision, but for me, it was really hard. We had worked so hard for six years to keep him alive. I'm not convinced that made us right or wrong for sure. Now I'm in a middle ground. Mm -hmm. So she's, even after his death, she's, she's got these lingering thoughts, concerns, and, and heaviness, and she's uh, definitely still sense-making. Yeah, yeah. What a lovely story. Yeah. yeah. Clara, do you want to pick up the next comment? Sure, this is from um, Carol. I'll just read it out. Thank you for this work. Your findings pointed out that the expectations of family to not only assist, but plan the process can create burden and affect grief. I wonder if patients could be pointed towards considering family caregiver values, beliefs and preferences, and having a negotiated conversation about how to go forward. Um, I worry about the burden continuing long after death. And that's a bit, Roseanne, what you, you shared just there. But I think the focus of this is having a negotiated conversation. Yeah. Any other comments about that? I think you're right, Claire. It's with any in life, you know, if we can just, just that open frankness and talk to the other, like, um, this is really hard for me. How are you doing? What can we do to make it different? What can we do to make it better? Um, yeah. Right, and really focusing on the difference in the values and beliefs, because when values don't meet up, it can cause a lot of conflict. Yeah. Or even like 
drawn maybe for your loved one a metaphor like um you know dad i want to help you and you're saying you want this and this and this to happen but you've only got so much energy and your energy is like gold so so how should we spend it wisely and dad i've only got so much energy so i want to spend mine carefully let's really figure out what's most important for you and how i can mm -hmm. help you mm -hmm. i i don't know like you you're right lean in yeah and i'm really curious it takes a lot of um a skilled a person skilled in communication whether that's a nurse or whether that's a social worker an ot whoever has the best relationship with that person but really um drawing out those underlying values and beliefs because it's those are the things that are hard to put our finger on them but we really feel them deep in our heart so it takes a skilled um, practitioner um, such as yourself or your team to really draw those values out. Great. We have a comment from Galena. We had an interesting conversation this morning about MAID, the thought that a natural death allows more time to process and prepare compared to MAID, where it's so sudden, more like a traumatic death experience. So it's interesting to hear people's experience. And I think it is interesting to think about that because you talked about made being a way of slowing down processes and experiences for people. And yet sometimes we think that a natural death provides more time. So mm -hmm. I don't know if you have anything to comment about that, but it is it is interesting to think about. And, you know, even with natural um, deaths, for example, if someone has a heart attack and they they just they just drop, you know, um, a young person, they're gone instantly. There is no time for a goodbye. So, yeah, different deaths, different situations. Um, but just in any situation, what can you do to slow it down so that you're present and then you can focus on that and hold on to it later? I think that's the key, just to slow down any aspect um, you know, whether it's just pausing and grabbing their hand and holding it, just, just the little thing that will add so much meaning. Mm -hmm. I, I think it takes a little bit of, um, well, maybe a little, maybe a lot of confidence in the nurse to offer that validation to the family. Yeah. Because that meaning could be anything from, you know, I've asked people, what's your hope for? And they hope for a strawberry milkshake from Dairy Queen. And so we had a laugh, but, you know, you write it down. And so that creates meaning, but it needs that validation from all of the team around that family that those special little things, you know, become more special and are absolutely valid for the family to create a ritual around it. And like the story I read, how the, the, the daughter with her sister, the mom said, okay, I want Colin Firth and lemon pie. And those two daughters probably for the rest of their life are just going to chuckle about lemon pie. And they said that was their mother. That's what they did. So it's not a big fancy ritual, but they, they used to sit down and have something good to eat and watch a movie. So um, it just shines something that can shine a light and, and give a person something to hold on to with their heart. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. yeah. There's well, one. Oh, go ahead, Joe. No, go ahead. We might have time for one last comment. <laughs> yeah, there's a comment here from Joanne that's great about, you know, what are volunteers permitted to do? Can they have conversations around beliefs and values? Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, different volunteers have different areas of knowledge. They come to us with this beautiful, rich life and knowledge base. So some are more comfortable going there. And then they also have a relationship to go there um, and talk about those deep beliefs and values. So that was a great, great way to highlight the, the important work that volunteers do at hospice. Well, unfortunately, our time has run out, but this has been really a wonderful conversation. And I think the comment by Laura is very fitting um, that was really an aha moment for her and I think probably for many of us that MAID is not a medical event but a personal one and I think all of your stories and your findings really really help signal and help us understand how personal and important this event is for both yeah. the person who is undergoing MAID and also their family and friends. So Thank you so much for sharing this research and engaging us in this conversation today. 
Um, and there are many thank yous coming in, uh, really with appreciation. I also want to thank everyone who joined us today um, to reflect on this topic and to learn a little bit more about it. And I hope that you might join us in the future for one of our upcoming webinars with the North Okanagan Hospice Society as well. So thank you once again. Thanks, thanks to everyone. Have a lovely day. Thank you. Bye-bye.